Hello there, Baha'i Blogcast listeners. It's me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is a special coronavirus COVID-19 update audio introduction. I certainly hope that you're all staying very safe and listening to the advice of our public health professionals during this global health crisis. If you haven't gotten a chance, please listen to uh, my interview with Dr. Robert Kim Farley, which is all about the uh, the virus and the pandemic. And several of the podcast interviews had been recorded in the previous weeks and months as we slowly drip them out into the blogosphere. And we've got some amazing upcoming episodes that don't reference the pandemic. And it seems kind of odd because a new chapter for humanity has definitely opened with the advent of this incredible international health crisis. This episode you're about to hear was you know, recorded at a time when we were talking about things quite differently and looking at the world quite differently. Nonetheless, we thought that this conversation and a couple other conversations I had in the previous months were too valuable to postpone or delay, and we really wanted to release. So, virus or no virus, quarantine or no quarantine, pandemic or no pandemic, I bring you this very special episode Please enjoy. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, Baha'is of the world, people that are not Baha'is of the world, spiritual seekers everywhere, philanthropists, education enthusiasts, such an exciting guest is here with me in my home office today. This person is very near and dear to my heart. I've worked uh, intensely with her over 10 years 11, 12 years, perhaps. I don't even know how long. Um, Manaz Javid is founder of the uh, Baha'i-inspired nonprofit, uh, the Mona Foundation, and um, a lifelong Baha'i with a lot of great stories and a fascinating perspective on both philanthropy and education uh, that I just, I cannot wait for you guys to hear. I'm so excited about this conversation. How was that set up, Manaz? Thank you very, very much, Rain. This is really amazing. I don't know what to say with all the compliments, but it's been an incredible pleasure to have you as a friend, as a colleague, and as a co-worker. See, now you better be good. Though. That's, yes. That introduction is putting <laughs> that introduction a lot of pressure. Put a lot of pressure, pressure on, on you. Yes. <laughs> so, Manaz, let's start at the very beginning. I often like to do this with the guests. I mean, the meat of the conversation is really about Mona Foundation, what it does, what makes it different what its philosophy is, what you've learned about grassroots education over the, doing it for the, over the last 20 years. But let's get to know you a little bit. Uh, you were born in Iran. Can you tell us a little bit about your family's Baha'i stories? I think that oftentimes the, uh, the Persian friends don't share as much as they, as they should, like the stories of their, the hardships of their, of their relatives, parents, grandparents, um, how they became Baha'is uh, in the motherland of the Baha'i faith and um, how that influenced their family history. Well, thank you very much. Actually, uh, very, very pleased to have the opportunity to really share it because I don't talk about it to- too often. And um, so I, I was born in Iran in a small town and I spent the first few years of my life there. I come from a uh, family uh, that have been Baha'is for uh, fifth generation Baha'i. What? Fifth generation? Fifth generation Holy Baha'i. Moly. I come from a very wonderful, devoted, and charitable charitable or uh, parents. My father was a physician, and he really spent all of his life in service to the poor. My mother was the perfect couple. Uh, you know, he gave uh, them the medicine and helped them heal, and she clothed them and fed them as uh, they came through our doors all through my childhood. So I learned a lot uh, from my parents, and that's how really my values were shaped at that time. So um, 
I actually, I would like to tell and share a story that uh, puts together everything for me and uh, all the work with the Mona Foundation. Sure. That uh, when I was 12 years old, um, and of course we had a sort of a semi-comfortable life. Uh, and my father, like I said, was a physician. And what town was this? Uh, this was in southern part of Iran, a small town called Masjid Suleiman. My father worked for the oil company, so we were rather comfortable. But uh, for a summer, we came to Tehran, and my mother, uh, on a, in a very, very uh, rainy, cloudy day, took me for a cab ride around the southern part of Tehran, where uh, they, you know, where the sort of the very impoverished um, areas were, uh, the slums of Tehran at that time, a sea of tents and makeshift huts and gave me a ride around that area for about half an hour, didn't say a word. She and I were alone in this cab. And uh, when we arrived home, she looked me in the eyes and she said, don't forget Mahnas, um, your responsibility towards others. And uh, that made an incredibly um, deep impression on my soul. I never, ever forgotten it. So their example of uh, their life and my mother's intentional move to expose me to uh, people who were less fortunate than us at the very beginning of my life really shaped me as who, uh, who I was, uh, who I became at that time and later. Wow, that's beautiful. And how did, you, how did your family come to leave Iran? Was it during the revolution? Uh, my my parents had very 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 keen about the education of their children, particularly their girls, three boys, three girls. So they were very intent that all the girls should receive their highest education. So we were uh, we my father uh, sent us out of Iran, starting from early sixties with my oldest brother, and so we were all uh, sent. At, by the time we were in, in first year of high school, we were sent to the U.S. to go to school. My parents actually stayed th uh, through 1978. Uh, they were Baha'is. Uh, my father lost his job because he was a Baha'i. Uh, our house was, our apartment was invaded, attacked. My parents left really with two suitcases in their hands uh, in the middle um, of 1978 as refugees. And then uh, later on, we were able to bring him into the U.S. as by then we were citizens. So. Mm. And where did you go in the U.S. first and what were you studying? Uh, so I was uh, first, <laughs> my father, I actually lived with an American family uh, for a while and uh, through my high school years and then went to... Um, where was this? Uh, this is in upstate New York, a small town called Phelps, New York. Then, uh, now, what's that like? Now, take me to the <laughs> mid-late 70s and little Manaz Javid, uh, uh, Baha'i Iranian girl, is in Phelps, New York, which I lived in New York for 13 years. I've never heard of Phelps, New York. It's such a small town. It's just like a town of 5,000 people with a main street, a church and a drugstore on one side of the street and a post office on the other side and across town, the high school I attended. And that was the town. And it was just the most incredible shock to my system to be placed, taken away from my incredible surroundings, filled and surrounded by friends and family and uh, huge big cities into this little small Americana town and how were how were you treated by the uh, the people of Phelps was there was there prejudice that you underwent or was there love and welcoming what was that experience well, I like? was here you know in 19, 1969 so at that time no one had heard about Iran and so everyone would say where do you come from and they all actually thought and I was you know I sort of played with them that uh, you know we wrote uh, uh, Camels. <laughs> so, so I, for the whole entire year of my high school in Phelps, New York, I carried the story that my father was very rich. And so we had two camels, actually. One took me to school and the other one returned me, returned, <laughs> took me back home. <laughs> but I loved the town and I loved the family that I lived with. I learned about uh, the real, uh, real, um, 
you know, real Americans. I learned about their... Yeah, you, uh, weren't, in, you weren't in Beverly Hills. You weren't in I Manhattan. Was, no, you were... I was right in the heart of America. and uh, During a very a time of great civil unrest. And... Civil unrest. I learned about civil rights. I, you know, actually marched uh, and sang uh, We Shall Overcome with my uh, high school kids and uh, friends and others. So I learned a lot from that family from my experience as I was going through high school there. So uh, so what did it look like? I didn't have, you know, I didn't know a word of English when I first came. And so for the first three months, I was hungry because, you know, they would serve me food and I would just say, no, thank you, like any good Persian girl. Uh-huh. And they would take the food away. So, so this is like tarof. It was like, like tarofing, you know. Like, oh, no, no, I couldn't possibly put yes, you out by and having so, some food. And so the only thing that I could eat is that was when I I just went... want to pause a second because some people may not know about this. <laughs> Torof kind of tradition of like, oh, no, no, I couldn't possibly. And then you're supposed to say, yes, yes, yes. And then you say, oh, no, no, no. And then, yes, yes, yes. yes. And finally, yes. You, someone prevails. It's kind yeah. of a, a politeness yeah, contest it's a, it, almost. Yeah, 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 it's like politeness to refuse the food you're offered and say, no, thank you very much. And then take it the third time that they offer. And that is, uh, you know, uh, considered to be polite. Well, they certainly didn't know anything about the tradition, nor did I have the language to say what I really needed. So honestly, for the first three months, I was hungry. And all I ate was um, chocolate at at school, because that's the only thing I could actually buy at school in this um, cafeteria they had. So um, you're still I, pretty I keen starved. for chocolate, aren't you? I, did, I, did, I, I noticed you. You will. You you put just, down some chocolate. In. I just yes. I, love, I remember that starvation period and how chocolate kept me. Uh, but uh, so that was the my early life uh, and the beginning of early life in the U.S. I was pretty uh, quick with my studies. I had. Uh, done pretty well in Iran and so in about a year I graduated from high school so I uh, I would have you know instead of three years four years you graduated early from high school very early in high school and then I went to University of um, uh, Nebraska where my brother lived for one year decided that was just way too cold for me and I drove south and stayed in the University of Houston that's where I um, started my undergraduate. And at that time, you know, uh, we were going through, you know, there was the, this country was going through a great deal of change and uh, sort of value um, shifts. And I was really looking for a way to find purpose and meaning in my own life, in addition to going to schools and in addition to doing really well here and there. And, um, and I decided that, um, you know, so you come to this country with the idea of building a life for yourself, independent, and I had that, you know. So as soon as I came in, of course, I worked so that I could pay for my education. So I was working and I was paying for my what education. What were you doing working? I actually worked in a hospital as an administration, you know, in an admin role. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's really how I paid for my tuition. And by that, I was able to rent a great apartment. And then I, you know, uh, was able to buy a car. So all the fancy stuff that every student one uh, was looking for was there for me. And one day I looked at it and I said, is that all life is about? And I decided it was not. So right about that time, I heard about an opportunity to serve uh, at the Baha'i World Center as a bilingual uh, person, both Mm -hmm. English and and Persian. Uh, I thought my Persian was pretty good, you know, and uh, um, I found out later that it really wasn't what I thought it was. Because you really only had Persian up till age 14 or 15. Yes, about 14. And then, so, so... Uh, and But I really learned English fairly quickly, and I was able to get the nuances right because I lived in an American family, and so I sort of had integrated pretty well. Uh, I applied for the position, so I left school. I left. But before home. before we jump over to you working in the Baha'i World Center, what was it like being a Baha'i in Houston? I'm taking this as like the early 70s? Kind yes. Of? So yes. before there were really yes. many Persian Baha'is in the United States yes. at all. What, yes. what was your experience like? At the uh, Give us a glimpse in the, uh, the American Baha'i community in like yes. Houston in that time. Interesting question, Rain, because... 
even though each one of, uh, so some of uh, um, those of us of Persian background born in Baha'i families, I think Baha'u'llah tests each one of us, at least tested me to make sure that I believed in him and in his mission and in his principles and ideals. Uh, and I remember, and so at the beginning when I was in the U.S., I had no language. I, there was no way, there was no way for me to connect with my environment. And I was absolutely alone. You know, it was the first time in my life that I was absolutely alone in my head. I did not have anyone to support me. I could not communicate. And for the, for the first three months, I was in this incredible vacuum. And I remember very clearly one night when in high school at that time, I started, uh, 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 crying and uh, asked God to tell me if he really existed um, uh, because I needed, you know, I, that if, if it was true that to give me a sign because I really was not, I did not consider myself a true deep and convicted Baha'i by then. You know, mm. I had inherited the faith and, you know, we had lived in a very small town in Iran. We were prohibited to have classes we were prohibited to have feast we had no community in iran where i was raised and mm. so so in that moment in that period of time in my life where i was absolutely alone by myself i asked god to show me whether he existed or not because i really didn't have the faith the faith the conviction and uh, i had an incredible experience i mean it was very um, it wasn't like, okay, uh, you know, bird flew in or, uh, you know, I saw a white angel coming in from the sky or anything. It wasn't that. It was just that this incredible sense of tranquility and peace and light that filled me. And I knew then he was with me. That's where I found the Baha'i faith in my moments of aloneness and in a sincere desire to know the truth. And uh, I was privileged to have that experience and it's never left me. And so I carried that with me to Houston. Houston was a mature Baha'i community. I had, uh, by then, I, so I immediately became a member of the teaching committee, you know. And so I was working full time. I was going to school full time. I was a member of the teaching committee. I became a member of all kinds of assembly committees here and there. Feast. But for those who don't know you, this is this is you in a nutshell. <laughs> this is you've never changed since then because you always have three full time jobs and managed to do an incredible amount of service at the exact same time. No one knows how you do it. Even your children, they they're. <laughs> flummoxed by it. Well, uh, thank you. But that's how it was, you know. And I love that Baha'i community. It was dynamic. It's alive. It was young. Uh, and Diverse. Diverse. Absolutely diverse everywhere. And the faith was everything. Hmm. You know, the faith was our way of expressing our desire for a better and more just society. That was our way of serving the interests of others. And I had the privilege of being with an incredible group of people uh, or youth at that time, involved in a lot of teaching and in love with what we were doing in service to others. It was really a beginning of the exercise of giving generously to those around us. And oh, that's I loved beautiful. It. But then jump ahead. Now you're at the Baha'i World Center in the mid 70s. Is this, is, am I right? 75, yes. 76? 70, 77 through 79. Okay. That's when I was invited to. So there was still a I, lot of hands of the cause oh puttering around. Oh, my goodness. And you know, I was. Ruhia Khanum. And... Ruhia Khanum. You know, I was in 1977 when I received uh, the notice from the World Center that they were looking for a bilingual person. I applied, and as soon as I received the response, I left school, and I left. You know, I just did not even pause. I just gave the key to my apartment to my brother and left for Haifa. And uh, so I thought that I actually knew Persian, you know. Mm. <laughs> uh, so at that time, 77, there were no youth in, at the World Center. There was only the house members, the wives of the house members, the total of 15 people as a staff 
and that included the finance department, the secretariat. There and were every- 15 people one working five, at the Baha'i World one Center. One five, 15 in people. 77, that's 77. crazy. 77. And then, of course, the custodian of the Holy Shrine. So when the whole entire Baha'i community in Haifa got together, including the custodians, there were only about 150 of us. You wow. Know? Uh, so it was a really, really a privileged time uh, that I had in those two years. My desk was outside Mr. Nachjavani and Mr. Fatah's <laughs> offices. And my job uh, was to, uh, I started with, um, you know, um, uh, typing receipts for the incredibly sacrificial gifts that the Persian Baha'is were sending to the World Center towards building of the Ark, which they had started at that time. And I remember having issuing receipts or typing receipts in Persian, uh, giving receipts for something equal to like one penny at wow. that time to the Persian Baha'is. And Mr. Fatah Azam, every one of those receipts was signed by him on behalf of the House of Justice and received the mm. seal of the House of Justice. Wow. I think for the first three months, I typed about maybe 5,000 <laughs> receipts, mm. 5,000 receipts. And then um, uh, I was asked to uh, start translating uh, because they didn't have a translator at that time. And uh, Mr. Tahir Zadeh had created these dictionaries that compared the Persian of beloved Shoghi Effendi uh, to how he had translated the Persian words to, the in- to English. So I used those handwritten dictionaries. Wow. And the House, uh, I asked to translate the policy letters of the House of Justice written in uh, Persian into English. Mm. So that was my job for the entire uh, two years. But it was an incredibly unique experience because at that time, Mr. Furutan handed the cause, Mr. Furutan handed the cause, Mr. Faizi handed the cause, Mr. Dr. Mahajer handed the cause, Paul Haney <laughs> hand, you know, handed the cause, Mr. Khadam, many uh, handed the cause, beloved Ruhi Khanom. Uh, was there. Ruhi Khanom gave a deepening to our, you, you know, youth group, you know, we mm. had, we had arranged and asked her to kindly do that. This is a very, very privileged wow. two years of my life. Um, and I really shaped who I am now. Um, very, 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 in a very profound way. So you're there at the Baha'i World Center as a youth surrounded by all of these Hands of the Cause <laughs> and early House of Justice members, there had to have been some stories that you can share with us uh, about that time. Yes, like I said, we were the first group of youth invited by the House of Justice. So two from the US, two from New Zealand, and two from Ireland. So actually six of us were there. And they, really the whole entire community embraced us. You know, they were just absolutely wanting to be sure that we were felt at home, that we were not uh, alone and that we were cared for. So uh, incredible privilege reigned really to be in their presence and to be able to uh, have learned from them all, everything that we observed. You know, we learned how to live by just looking at how they lived every day of their lives. So I want to tell a funny story, actually, with uh, about Mr. Uh, Hand of the Cause, Mr. Furutan. I absolutely love them. And of course, he was that, you know, he's just incredibly loving, embracing, giving, generous, and with a huge sense of humor. So one day, uh, as I was there, and we, we were giving a small flats, you know, so we were alone. Uh, we lived alone in a very small apartment that the house had um, given us. Um, and and so uh, and I would work very hard. I would work really late. I would, had a typewriter at home uh, as well, and I would really work till midnight almost every night to be sure to make sure that I my job was done. So one night I was extremely tired, and I went to bed, and I had this incredible nightmare. Uh, about my family, that they were involved in an accident and everything, but then, uh, but then that they were all well and that they had taken to the to this beautiful place, 
and I thought that they had died and had gone to heaven and I was extremely agitated about it and extremely um, also very proud of myself that my parents had gone to heaven because it was so beautiful and there was all these beautiful areas and they were sitting there and uh, enjoying themselves. And so I went to Mr. Furutan and I said, uh, Mr. Furutan, I had this horrible dream, you know, about uh, everything that had happened to my parents, but that I believe that they are in heaven now because I saw them seated in this incredibly illumined place under a beautiful a beautiful tree. <laughs> and I said to Mr. Furutan, Mr. Furutan, what is the meaning of this, of this dream? And Mr. Furutan lovingly looked at me and he said, Dukhtaram, my daughter, you must have eaten too much the night before. <laughs> <laughs> heartburn. <laughs> he probably had heartburn. Your parents are well and nobody knows what heaven looks like. So... <laughs> So that's the story about Mr. Furutan that I never forget. It's just so, in such a matter-of-factly said. Mm. You know, don't think that you're visionary and your parents have a place in heaven. You know, you probably ate too much. (laughs) (laughs) You probably ate too much. (laughs) Uh, I think that the other story that I like to share is really uh, actually about... um, Mr. Fatah Azam. I was there when Khomeini returned to Iran in 1978, and the House of Justice had just published the Tablets of Baha'u'llah, and Mr. Fatah Azam was giving the youth a deepening on, on the book. So we were all in his home, and with his eloquence and beautiful voice and chants and incredible insights uh, he was uh, helping us through the material and he received the call from Iran and uh, and the call said that the Khomeini had returned and the Baha'is were uh, you know being systematically uh, chased and followed and beaten and um, so the news was not very good and I never forget his face Mr. Fur, Mr. Fatazam, you know, that beautiful, incredible countenance just turned white as a sheet. And he came back to the gathering and he said, we need to read the tablet of uh, the fire tablet to say prayers for the Baha'is of Iran because their tests have started. Well, of course, we said the tablet of uh, uh, the fire tablet that evening but I do recall that for the following year that I was there, that he received at least throughout the day and night, he would receive calls from wonderful friends who would communicate to report the events that was happening in Iran, the persecutions and the sufferings of the friends. And I never, ever forget how much that had impacted him and, of course, us as we were receiving these letters from Iran, uh, particularly myself having to translate this heartbreaking accounts of the friends who so patiently um, were were uh, steadfastly standing, standing their ground uh, in the face of extreme persecution. So you must have been in the Holy Land when uh, when Mona was uh, killed. Actually, I left in and left the Holy Land my service in 1979 because I was only invited for two years on the condition of returning, finishing up my school and returning. It was in nine. You know, um, Mona was um, executed in 1983. Uh, but again, as this incredible connection between Mona, the person, Mona, the martyr, uh, the House of Justice issuing the, the first letter in 1983 on social economic development uh, and the same year and this whole incredible experience of having having had translated the account of all the Baha'is who were under severe persecution those years, you know, they they make impression on your soul. 
you can't, you know, you don't forget them. It's not something you hear and then forget and you say, oh, how bad. They change you and transform you. And I, I, I remember, I remember I heard about the martyrdom of Mona and the nine other women, how they had given their lives, how Mona had cried in the prison uh, once. Uh, and when mother, her mother asked why, uh, she had said that she missed the, 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 the girls in the orphanage that she was serving. She was really missing the children, uh, having, knowing her incredible compassion and love for children, for education, for service, and then having uh, re reading this letter from the House of Justice in 1983 about the same time about that um, it is the responsibility of all Baha'is now to raise capacity, to in fact put their faith in action, in service to others. And for me, there was absolutely no question about the connection of all the sacrifices of the beloved friends of Iran, including Mona, to this incredible outburst of the Baha'i community to start waking up uh, standing on our feet and actually living our faith in action, in service to others, as Baha'u'llah has asked us. Uh, and, and that was a really a very, f uh, very impactful experience when, uh, of course, when Mona was martyred and when this letter was issued. So all of these things dovetail is what you said, is what you're saying. The, the, the suffering of the Baha'is in Iran at the, during the revolution, um, the execution of Mona and hundreds of others, uh, Baha'is, and um, then the release. And what document is it about it's social and economic? The first letter of the House of Justice, the first letter that the House of Justice issued on social economic development was issued in 1983, wow. the same year that Mona and the nine women were martyred. It was a very p close proximity even in time. Wow. And for me, there were just two of them happened together. It was just like the whole, the, you know, everything happened. It was just the blood that watered this incredible movement of Baha'i community from building community within to arising to serve others externally. And to me, that was, that became the genesis, really. The genesis of Mona Foundation is the experience of my parents, um, my mother taking me out for a ride to the slums of Tehran, uh, my experience at the World Center, and he, tra you know, the, the suffering of the Baha'is of Iran, all the way to 1983 when this letter was issued. That's the genesis of Mona Foundation. That's where Mona was formed. So before we get to the organization, just take us through real quick. What, what, how does this bring you through the 80s? How did you end up in Seattle and working for Microsoft? <laughs> so, uh, so it's a very good question. So I really wanted to, uh, of course, I returned from the Holy Land to finish my undergraduate because my father was really, really intent that I finished my education. By then, the revolution happened in 1979, and I only had a Persian passport. I could not go back. I could not travel. And, uh, and so um, I um, continued my education waiting to go back to, um, to Haifa. And, was, um, and as I was waiting to get my American passport, you know, because I was eligible for it and I applied for it to get it, um, I applied to the Baha'i, you know, BIC, Baha'i International Community at the UN, and moved to the UN to, and worked there for a while, waiting for my passport. And then, of course... This is uh, in Geneva or... No, this is Brussels in New York. In oh, New in York. New York. In okay. New York, okay. yes, in New York. And so, so I went to New York to wait, and that is where I met my uh, husband, uh, our, my very beloved Shannon Javid, uh, who I had met while he was on pilgrimage in uh, Haifa. And uh, after an incredible internal challenge and prayers and everything married and um we wanted to go what back. was the challenge there he's <laughs> well a, i wanted a, to go he was a great awesome guy i loved guy. him i loved handsome him handsome dude yes he's yeah. a handsome dude he's a great guy he's incredibly generous what's he's the incredible. problem it was i wanted to go back to haifa 
and you know he he was working up in, in Massachusetts and and we didn't know I didn't know that he would come but then uh so I had an internal challenge am I do you do I really want to get married or do I really want to go back to Haifa and I said a lot of prayers about it and and I felt guided to 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 get married on the condition that we go back to Haifa and of course um, our first child was born within a year and the house of justice did not want young children at that time so I never went back um, but uh, <laughs> married a great guy. He's a still. We're still together. <laughs> I have two wonderful boys. So, so after that, of course, uh, I, you know, I uh, had children, um, two beautiful boys, born very close to each other, um, and decided that um, okay, um, while I stayed home, I really had started a career. But I very was very conscious of the fact that I wanted to raise my children myself. So I really left the world of careers and all of that and I stayed home for five years. And it wasn't easy. You know, we didn't have any money at that time or anything. Shannon, has, I think Shannon proposed to me by saying, I earn $700 a month and I have $300 <laughs> car payment. But if you have me for $400 a month, I, I'd love to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That's so weirdly transactional. I it's swear like, to God, that was so his much proposal. Money I have and that was that was his proposal. If you're you know, willing so to live on four hundred dollars a month, four hundred dollars a month, I love to share it with you. So I thought he was honest, and I said, "Yeah, I can live on that." And and uh, so we we were married, and uh, so we didn't have much, but I wanted to stay home with the kids for the first five years, and then, and of course, I went back, respecting my father's wish. I uh, finished my um, master's and then my um, uh, doctorate of educational leadership. So my doctorate in educational leadership. Um, and what's your master's and in? Later. My master's in, in education mm -hmm. and my um, doctorate in um, educational leadership with great deal of focus on technology because at that time Microsoft was just percolating and everything was about uh, this technology that was going to change our world. And I was just absolutely attracted to it and intent to learn. And so I was totally focused my studies on the impact of technology on learning and on human interaction. So that's what my degree was. Then Shannon's jobs changed from uh, East Coast uh, to the West Coast. And that's how we ended up in Seattle. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. when I first met you, I think you were still working at Microsoft or had just left. So you yes. were there in the early years. Yes, I was there. Uh, I actually taught at the University of Washington Computer Science de uh, Department for a couple of years. And then I was hired by Microsoft. Um, and because, you know, this user, um, human, human computer user interface was a new discipline and I was pretty good at it. So they hired me in. So I was actually worked at Microsoft for um, seven years, a bit more than seven years. Incredible learning experience. Um, my second and third PhDs are from just working at Microsoft, you know, mm. I learned so much. Incre it was a very exciting time, you know, it was like, okay, Bill said a computer on every desk, nobody believed him, everybody laughed at him, but we were there and we knew it was happening, we knew what was coming, sure. and so we were right into it, and I tried to teach myself everything that had to do with, um, you know, um, computer science and engineering and all of that to the extent that I needed it for my jobs, um, and uh, so it was an incredible learning experience. That's where I met you mm -hmm. uh, at that time, mm -hmm. I think. Um, Mona was formed in uh, 1999, April 21st of 1999, right, uh, right when I was finishing up my doctorate and right when I was about to start at Microsoft. So starting at Microsoft and the start of the Mono Foundation actually coincide together. And it's been an incredible experience because what I learned from Microsoft was uh, absolutely necessary for the growth and, you know, sustainability of the Mono Foundation. But I also, uh, you know, the, my life and my experiences at Mono Foundation definitely impacted 
how I became who I became at Microsoft in my different positions. And I, and I was pretty good at it, you know, I, and I, I, think, I think I was promoted several times very expediently, and I attribute that all to the experiences that I had brought in with me uh, from the work on, uh, with the Mona Foundation. Wow. So what specifically did you learn at Microsoft and the other companies that you were working for at that time that you were able to apply to Mona Foundation? So one, uh, so at Microsoft being a new discipline, for teams were formed and you had to learn how to work within, um, within teams and how to make sure that the product that you were creating was not only was great, but but that it had to be a team. You know, it had to be a team effort. There was no one way that any one in alone could produce what we had to produce to give away. Right, because so you need an, you need an engineer. You need yeah. someone good with language. You yeah. need someone good with the front end and yes. design. Yes, a program and... manager and a design and a and a coder and a you know and and a user experience guy and a you know and a product management and marketing and all of these have to come to bear as you're creating a product to take it to the to the market so i learned what it looks like to create a great team and hold it together to deliver something very meaningful so organizational skill is very 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 specific set of skills that you that um, that I definitely immediately could apply to the work of Mono Foundation. Mono Foundation is you know started as a volunteer organization. There were you know four of us. We had nothing. Yeah. We we had nothing. Its yeah. origins were so humble. T- t- tell tell that it, story about going to the conference and how it really that first interaction with the school in Haiti and how it started. Yeah, it was an incredible. I was finishing up my doctorate, and uh, I went to a conference in Florida. A social economic different development conference in Florida, and many of these uh, schools around the world, or many sort of set projects, social economic development projects, would come and sort of show their work in the country from which they came. So as we were going through this this hallway, looking at different projects, because I was very very keen on learning what that looked like. Um, we stopped by a very humble, you know, trifled sort of a folding table exhibit of a school in Haiti called Anis Zanuzi. There was a couple of Haitians, beautiful, very humble people standing around the table and, uh, and showing the pictures of their kids and uh, the school that they had in Haiti and and just absolutely moved my heart. And I remembered how much my parents had sacrificed to put me through school, Mm. but that how much doors and opportunities had opened up because I was an educated person, you know, oh, Mm. wow, I was getting my doctorate and all of a sudden everybody wanted to hire me, this and that. All the opportunities were there for me. And so I said to, uh, and I remembered my mother, you know, don't forget your responsibility to others. Don't forget who you are and what your responsibility is to others. So I asked uh, these wonderful couple, well, how much does it cost to uh, educate a person or a student in Haiti? And they said, $25 a month. $25 a month? I wasn't earning that much money at that time, but I certainly could manage $25 a month. So I said, that's amazing. You know, this is really amazing. And then I went to another table. There was a Badi school in Panama. Had to started from a little carport of a wonderful couple. Just in their garage. In their they... garage. It, you know, it's a carport of their trailer home in the middle of nowhere. They had started this little after hours tutoring class that had turned into a little school at that time through third grade. I said, okay, how much does it cost to educate a child in Panama? He says, well, $30 a month. So... I went through that experience and then I went to sit lunch with a couple of friends and they gave us a bill for $120 for the dinner for three, four or five people, you know. Mm. And I said to myself, I could have just sent five kids to school for a whole entire month with just eating this lunch. So I stopped eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of your life, you've never eaten lunch. <laughs> 
<laughs> You've only spent I sent said, that money to Haiti <laughs> and <laughs> Panama. No. no, and I said, I remember my mother. I remember my experience in Haifa. I remembered uh, the exhortation of the House of Justice to really um, rise in service to others. And I saw these wonderful projects just needing a bit of support to send the, these wonderful kids everywhere to give them the opportunity of education. But how do you go from that, okay, $25 a month, how do you go from that to, hey, let's form a nonprofit that raises the money and gives it to these schools for that very purpose? How do, what does that discussion look like? Well, actually, in my head, you know, I, I think very systematically, you know, and I said to myself, okay, I want to s help this child go to school today, tomorrow, every day. So I, I wasn't thinking, I, I could not get myself to just write a check and say, okay, this is $25, send somebody. I wanted to make sure that that child went to school today, tomorrow, and the day after, and next year, and the following year, and graduated like I did. And for that, you needed an organization. I had learned enough to know that without an organization that could actually sustain efforts over time, you could not make a difference. Okay, you could send somebody to school today, but you couldn't do it the next day. Sure. So mm -hmm. that is really how it came to me. And I said, okay, it's time to put an organization together. And that's what education helps. You know, you learn about organizational development. You learn about certain principles that helps you uh, create things that uh, can continue your good intentions for prosperity, you know, posterity. So I uh, said to the couple of friends on the table that were still there, I said, okay, I think that I'm going to start a nonprofit to make sure that the kids in Haiti and Panama go to school. Uh, who, who would like to be with me? So two of them raised their hand. Oh, I'd love to be in there. And on the back of a napkin, and I still have the napkin, it's in the Mona's office framed now. On the back of a napkin, we wrote, okay, uh, the nonprofit, yes, great. And that the mission of it was certainly education. I was very keen that the focus be on educational girls. Uh, equality was very important. That uh, for us, for, for me, was you know, uh, without an educated mother and generations, both boys and girls, that we wouldn't be able to really sustain change. Um, so equality became very important. And of, of course, uh, community development, you know, it's not all about uh, graduating people, but yes, graduating people to be professionals, but with the ethics and understanding that they also have the responsibility to give back and how to how to develop their communities, a gift that my parents really had given me. So that first year, how much money did Mona take in <laughs> and disperse? At that, the first year, um, the first year we had one person who gave us one, uh, 10 shares of Microsoft for... $10,000. Mm. Of that, we paid $6,000 for the lawyers to file our papers and give us the nonprofit status uh, <laughs> in the U.S. to be recognized as a 501c3 public charity. We mm -hmm. wanted to be sure that we were a, you know, that we, that we were, um, our, you know, we were recognized by the government. And then we had of the five thousand that was left, four thousand that were left, we sent two thousand to Badi and two thousand to Sunusi. Okay. <laughs> to educate uh, as many children as they could with that money for the first year. So Mona Foundation starts in 1999 as an organization. A lot of people have heard of Mona Foundation. They maybe know that it's inspired by Mona's story. We can get to more on that later. But what? What specifically is Mona Foundation about? What makes it different than other educational nonprofits? What are the pillars of its philosophy? Wonderful. Um, so Mona Foundation started in 1999. Our mission is to support grassroots uh, educational initiatives that educate all children, empower women and girls, and really encourage uh, service to the community. So what differentiates us 
it really is um, there. I can ca count three or four or five principles that really set Smona apart. One is that we really, this whole idea of capacity at the grassroots, we believe change only happens at the local level. So uh, as a nonprofit here in the U.S., we do not go, say, to another country to build a school because they do not have access to education. So we don't initiate project from here in other countries. Rather, we in each country, we look for and uh, start um, uh, look for and find organizations that are aligned with our mission and then we support them to do what they think is the best thing for their community. So trusting in the local uh, uh, grassroots organization, knowing that they know their problems and therefore the solution to their problems has been an incredible key to our success. So we don't try to import our own ideas from the U.S. to wherever. Which is a very Western thing to do. Very Western. We've been, been doing it for two, three hundred years. Let's go to impoverished areas. Oh, we know best. Let's set up our systems there. And, you know, I know, I remember having a conversation with Oprah Winfrey. Sorry to name drop, but I did some stuff with her with Soul Pancake. And she, that was right when her school in Africa was opening. And she said the same thing. She said this was the biggest mistake of the way that she did it, to go build a building. A school is not a building. She went and built an actual building in Africa, hired the best teachers in Africa, brought in the best students in Africa. But, you know, then they were all moving to the United States and becoming dentists and weren't really impacting the continent of Africa or the poor communities that they came from. And so this is building capacity at the grassroots, uh, finding organizations that mirror the, the, the kind of ethics and philosophy of Mona is, uh, is key. Very one of the keys. And really, and then, and then trusting in them to come up with their own plans of development and through learning and through their experience, as they are learning through the experiences that they gain, to really scale their uh, their uh, solutions that they find and they test. So this whole idea, so one of the values of Mono Foundation that has really, really um, um, drives this is the uh, whole idea of believe in belief in the oneness of our humanity. So the belief in at the level of practice, translating that, if I believe that you, uh, you know, that we are all created equal. So when we go to a country where we have to believe that the person who is sitting on the other side, even though they may not have any of our uh, economic dis uh, advantages may not be uh, have a PhD or an educator or you know be economically very well I mean be very extremely poor that they are they have better insight and are equal and really respect them and and hear the solutions that they have devised to address their own problems so can you give us a specific example of where a community had a solution to their issues that you would not have, thought of coming kind of from a, a Western uh, materialistic perspective? I'll I, I just give you an incredibly wonderful uh, example in India. Uh, we work with a project called um, Study Hall Educational Foundation. So 10 years ago, they uh, came to us and they said, we really would like to start learning on how to, how to empower the girls to resist the social norms around early childhood marriage and, and um, this, you know, and um, uh, domestic violence. And, and so if we were a traditional foundation, we would have said, oh, this is incredible. We have this, all of this curriculum around uh, prevention of uh, domestic violence and equality of men and women. And, you know, why don't you come and use this curriculum in your school and, uh, and implement that to create change? We did not do that. We really respected Urvashi and we just said... The founder of the, founder the, of study, the hall. study Hall Educational Foundation. And we, we helped and supported her learning in the past 10 years of implementing this incredibly now successful 
Erohani Girls Empowerment Program that at this moment, at this very moment, after 10 years of effort, is now touching and has empowered 405,000 girls and has, you know, in, 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 in about 933 schools in the entire province learning how to resist how to respect themselves as equal person, how to resist the social norm, how to have the constructive dialogues with their parents, with their brothers, with the police, with their teachers and all of that to say no to domestic violence or to early marriage, childhood marriage and, and, and feel proud to be a girl in India. So, so it has taken 10 years we allowed them to test this. Because sometimes this stuff takes a while. Take it takes we a while. We can't like rush in an American, it would be an American way. Like, yeah. we need something by next quarter. Yes, you know? we and, need a- and, and, and or push our own values and say, well, what is your metric? What did you achieve? How much did you achieve? How did you spend this money? How, how did you spend that money? But allow the organization, the grassroots organizations to learn through the process and expand and and uh, and and scale, and that's where that program is now. This program has been recognized by Obama Foundation as real change makers. This program has been recognized by by Brookings Institution as one of the you know as really uh, one of the most outstanding girls empowerment program in the development world and elsewhere. Now Holly said that Dr. Irvashi Sani, who is a big Mona supporter and we support her and she's an incredible human being. Um, not a Baha'i, by the way. Um, not that that matters, but I think it's important that people know that listeners who might be Baha'is know that, you know, Mona Foundation is collaborating with all, all kinds of people. It doesn't really matter what your spiritual or religious belief is. We're just trying to make change in the world. But that Dr. Sani would come in to a class of girls like, how many of you girls are going to get married as children? None of you, right? No, you're not going to do it. And if, if what are you going to do if your parents say you've got to get married before you want to get married? And they'd raise their hands. We go to a lawyer, you know, and, like, <laughs> and they like, and she like just it charges them, just fills them right. with like empowerment to yes. to stand up for their rights, so their rights. And now we are seeing the results. So it's taken ten years. It's taken eleven years of continuous support and collaboration, trust in collaboration. In 2018, there was zero instance of child marriage in the 933 schools that were supported by this program funded by Mona. Wow. So that is an stat. We could sit here and do all kinds of things, create all kinds of curriculum and result in nothing, but we allowed her to test his her own way and now see the results. I think that that is one uh, way that Mona Foundation is differentiated for, uh, from other educational foundation. We work with grassroots organizations and support them, empower them, allow them to test their own programs and at point of scale, then help them scale to and expand their area of services. Isn't another one uh, how long we work with organizations? Yes, absolutely. There's also, uh, it's a very normal practice at the non- with nonprofits to just fund the project for one year, two years, three years, and then shift focus and go elsewhere. A long-term um, relationship and support is one of the cardinal principles that one of uh, follows because we believe that education takes time. You know, Rain, you can't send Walter to school for one year and say, sorry, I can't do it. I can't support you to go to school the next yeah. year. School and education takes time. And then it also takes time to build skills in the children or the students to be able to give back to their community and change the hearts and minds. Back to the same uh, example of Arahani Girls Empowerment Program. Now the girls, every year, march through a campaign called India's Daughters Campaign. They march on the streets, they meet with the police, they meet with their teachers, they meet with their social workers, to meet with the parents, meet with the brothers. They, uh, you know, gather signature for equality. They call it equality signature to make sure that, uh, that this does not happen to others. So this whole virtuous cycle of empowerment, giving them the skills to give back to their communities and then 
seeing the community change so that they can also, you know, change others is how the program has scaled in the past 10 years. We're very, very proud of just these two principles just totally set, sets Mona apart. Long-term relationship and support of the grassroots uh, organization, applying the Baha'i principles of equality, of justice, of universal oneness, education. universal education, and uh, respect and dignity and nobility of every human being. And I know that in this, because I was on, you know, full disclosure, I was on the board for about five years. Now I'm on the advisory board and I'm such a big fan of the nonprofit. But um, there have been many instances where um, we, you know, they submit grants, the schools submit grants, and they, and they say, like, I remember there was a school in Tanzania that wanted a grant for um, dormitories. And we're like, you don't even have like plumbing. You don't even have electricity. Why do you want dormitories? That's crazy. Like first things first, we would never have thought of that. And then you dig deeper and you find out that girls were being sexually assaulted on the, tr- way. On the way to and from mm-hmm. schools and they needed a safe place to stay during the week. And then on Friday evenings, they could all go together back home and be at home on the weekends. But this is not something we would have known in Seattle or Los Angeles mm-hmm. or New York about... Uh, the school from the outside that that seemed like a luxury and wasn't wasn't there something with like science labs and ad cam that you know there was other things that kind of we thought that that school in brazil that we thought they should invest in but they they came back with their own proposal and once we learned the wisdom then we were of course supporting them and we see the results i think that and this is part of the baha'i idea of the humble posture of learning. Exactly. Isn't it too, yeah, that yeah. the House of Justice is always talking about, yes. like, again, to just get out of this thing of like, we know the best we way. Know. What can we, we learn? We can learn. And particularly in the area of development, we do not have, Mr. Arbob has a wonderful saying that says, we do not know and do not understand a global uh, model of development. Otherwise, we would have world peace. If we knew how to develop everything successfully, we would have world peace. We are trying to learn, and the Baha'i community currently is in this incredible process of learning of how to change and create a just society for all of us. So this this humble posture of learning as we relate to other organizations or other individuals is in fact putting into action the value that be that this this whole entire value uh, of first of all of course the oneness but also understanding that we are developing we are creating this new model of development and i'm absolutely excited to be in the vanguard of it you know when mona foundation started talking about supporting grassroots educational initiatives or capacity building at the local level, nobody had heard about it, right? Mm-hmm, no. Mm-hmm. Now it's become the, you know, now it's become... It's a buzzword. The it's, buzzword. The United Nations talks about it. it, it and yeah, everybody talks about it. Lots of organizations, yes. Michelle Obama, et right, cetera. Right. And then we said very clearly in our mission statement, education for all, but with focus on empowerment of women and girls. Why? Because without an education, father and mother and uncle and brother, they still force their daughters and sisters, whatever, to get married at age 10. And nothing will change. You need to have the men in the conversation. You have They are a very important uh, part of the conversation. So then it became fashionable uh, to really focus on educational girls and everybody focused on educational girls and Mona kept on to our own principle, education for all, but with focus on empower girls empowerment. Now everybody, the pendulum is swinging right here that says equality cannot be achieved without our men behind us advocating for us without an educated male population that also advocates for it. Mm. So it's just an example of Mona being in the vanguard of setting, uh, of learning about what these, you know, what these principles are, how to put them to action, learn from the experience through a humble posture of learning, and then apply our learnings to our next steps uh, as we adopt uh, or work with new organizations to serve more. Now, you started in 1999, two organizations. You got that first grant for $10,000. Yes. Um, where Where is Mona at today? 
I'm uh, thrilled. I just finished our board meeting, and I'm really thrilled to say that in 2019, Mona Foundation uh, was able to support 19 um, organizations and institutions in 12 countries and directly supporting the education and empowerment of 423,000 students and 90% of whom are girls. Amazing. And what's the, what's the budget on, on, on this? <laughs> Our can, budget can is say... only 2 million. Yes. We, we, we are, we are hoping to raise 2 million in support, but uh, you know, we can do all of that rain because it's not like we are importing stuff from U S down to India, you know, or that we are not hiring a whole bunch of staff here in the U S uh, we are supporting grassroots organizations in different countries and therefore we are very very efficient and economical in the way that we support uh, you know extend our every dollar to educate children uh, it you know so you can hire somebody here for hundred fifty thousand dollars or you can hire somebody allow the grassroots organization to to hire who they need at the local level for uh, much more economically. And if you go to the Mona website, you can see the different schools and organizations it supports. And if you want to just donate to that school yes. or a scholarship or a classroom or something like that, you can do that as well. Yes, yes. Um, every every project that we support, we have a page. We try to be very, very authentic in the way we tell their stories. So there's a bit of history about each of these organizations, the work that they do, the impact they make. Uh, what specifically they need. And so if people want to participate in this incredible process of changing lives and transforming communities, they can go to monofoundation.org and learn for themselves and be a part of it. So let's bring this conversation back around to Mona herself. What, what was her last name? Mah Min Mahmoud Najad. Mahmoud Najad. Yes. Um, when she was executed for essentially being a Baha'i and for teaching children, um, at age 17, 17 when he died. Yes, she was imprisoned when she was 16 and, and uh, executed when she was 17. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how did that act and how does that act and the person of Mona, the memory of Mona, the heart of Mona beat in the Mona Foundation? Well, it was just a very uh, incredible experience actually we were sitting around that lunch table and so we had talked about our mission we put in certain principles down and everything and it came to okay what are we going to call ourselves and I had just read this book that was written about Mona uh, and uh, read about her about her life and uh, this video was out on her Mona and the children and I felt this incredible um um sense of defiance against all the tyranny that the, the Baha'is were um, being uh, suffering. Uh, so when it came, uh, and of course Mona, uh, in, the, in her life story, there, is this, there are three things that really, really set her apart, not only her incredible faith, but also her love for children and education of children, the fact that she had volunteered in an orphanage, so her commitment to service, um, but also her commitment to freedom and justice. She had written this essay on freedom and uh, in, in, as one of her class assignments. And wasn't that used as like evidence against her? It was used as an evidence against her when the, they, they searched the house um, and they found a tape with her uh, melodic voice and this uh, essay on freedom and they had they had arrested her and you know she's 16 years old rain i mean 16 year old beautiful young vivacious child uh, she was imprisoned she was in the company of nine other women and i know the name of every one of them i say them every year day to remind myself of uh, the work we are doing and for whom and, and finally put down because they would not want to deny their reality, you know? They could have said, no, I'm not a Baha'i, right? But that was their reality, and they, were, they, had, they wanted to be who they were. Um, they'd rather not live. So that was her example. And as we were naming the foundation, I remembered her story. I remembered her commitment to justice, to love for children, 
her commitment to uh, education. And I felt, okay, they silenced her, but we can call our foundation Mona and continue her unfinished work. And that's how we became Mona Foundation. It's beautiful. And where is Mona going? Where do you see the foundation 10 years from now? Well, um, we've been pretty uh, um, sophisticated and uh, uh, very methodical, deliberate in the way that we are building the organization to last. We have a wonderful team in place here. We are trusting a wonderful trusting relationship with other organizations we support. We are hoping that uh, as we learn, as we organically learn in collaboration with uh, the organizations that we support, that we continue to grow our services to more children, to more, uh, to more areas where it is needed. I think one thing that bears noting, and forgive me, I'm just gonna jump in on this, is that so many nonprofits and philanthropical efforts start with one person. And if that one person gets hit by a bus, the whole organization falls apart. So part of what is important also in the philosophy of Mona is that the schools that we support have a local board and have a kind of a, a system and an organization in place that it's not kind of the, the pet project of its charismatic founder starter, because so many nonprofits um, kind of suffer from that syndrome. So we've also created Mona Foundation and its board and its support structures so that it doesn't matter if the entire board gets hit by a bus, it's going to continue mm -hmm. as an organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important and very true in that uh, Mona, of course, the local organizations at different countries, absolutely, they're growing capacity, they're growing their strength, and they will be there without, with or without Mona. They're, we're just supporting their, uh, their initiatives and growth. Within, for Mona Foundation, the nonprofit in the U.S., and we're very deliberate, we have a, a professional team in place, and the organization is keep on ticking regardless of who sits around the table as board members. So 10 years from now, just more schools? Uh, I think that our plan is that within the next two years that we will increase the number of students we support to 500,000, and then uh, we go through the three-year growth cycles. So, uh, and we will uh, you know, plan our next stage of growth depending on what we learn and depending on what the needs might be. All right, so it's kind of learn as you go. And it's see, learn as we go in a humble posture. Mm -hmm. Yes, in a humble mm -hmm. posture of learning and very, very grateful to have the opportunity to be able to serve and continue Mona's work. And is Virtues Education part of what Mona does and supports? Well, I think that it's not so much the Virtues Education, but I think that um, we are very, very... Um, uh, what is very important to Mona Foundation and to almost every organization that we support is that the purpose of educate, you know, they align with us in the purpose of education being uh, for the betterment of the communities. And so this ethical framework, you, you know, you have to grow kids not only to become professionals, great academicians, great professionals, great artists, great everything, but also have the ethical framework, the moral framework the uh, uh, and sense of responsibility to know that their life in this world has meaning and they have a role to play in the development and the betterment of their own not only themselves and their families but also their own communities so uh, so this moral empowerment programs uh, or or ethical education and it takes a different shape and name and form in different countries but the end result, which is growing a generation of youth that have service to the community as a way of life, as a part of their education, is what also differentiates Mona. Without it, I don't think that any change can be sustainable. So I think the lesson from this incredible story, and thank you for sharing it today, is if any parents are listening out there, this all started with one cab drive through <laughs> a really poor neighborhood of Tehran. And I think that's so important uh, for parents to take their children and show them firsthand what poverty looks like and to remind them of their 
moral, civic, ethical, spiritual responsibility to be in service to the very poorest among us. And that each one of us, regardless of who we are and what we have or have not, can and can make a difference if we just rise to take the first step. I think that that also was the message uh, that I've taken away with myself and this whole idea of philosophy is education is that you are here, if you just rise, you can make a difference. You are empowered, you can make a difference if you take this step. And that's so that, that is also part of the very part of the important part of the picture, Rain. And Mona Foundation accepts donations. People can uh, yes. give money if yes. they wanted to. Absolutely. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Absolutely. I don't know. I don't Absolutely. know why. Absolutely. I... And I have to tell you, you know, I mean, we are very efficient organization, Rain. We have, you know, we our administrative cost is less than 15%. But we also have a wonderful private donor and that uh, covers that 15% administrative cost. So the dollars... So everything that comes in is every, going to the schools. And everything that comes in is spent in support of the schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not doesn't go straight to the schools, but if schools need several schools need several different things, but everything that comes in supports the education of children in the organizations we support. That's right. fantastic. Manas Javid, this has just been an honor. Thank you for fitting in this podcast interview after your long weekend long board meeting uh, here in Los Angeles. Thanks so much for, for joining me in my little office. My honor, my privilege, and thank you, Rain, for being such an incredible person and uh, such a wonderful influence on myself as a person. Oh, well, that's just, that's, that's just poppycock. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.